Well, good morning, everyone, and a big welcome. I think you've all been muted, but I haven't. So uh, there we go. Lovely to see you all. Uh, there's a new function where we can't unmute you all now. You have to unmute yourselves when you want to say something, but uh, Ruth's going to keep you all muted for the service. Welcome uh, to All Saints and to St. Michael's Angersley for our morning service today. Welcome especially if you're new or you're visiting or if this is uh, your first Zoom encounter. Welcome to regulars as well who are now Zoom pros. Isn't it remarkable that only three months ago most of us had never even heard of Zoom and here we are, uh, many of us experts at it by now. Um, as we seek to begin to think about re-engaging with uh, life and community and with one another, we're beginning to ask, what have we gained as a church uh, that we actually want to keep when we re-engage with things properly? And there's all sorts of things we might want to lose some things as well. But what do we want to keep that's been particularly precious uh, to us? Personally, one of the highlights for me has been being one church family together, uh, meeting at one time as much as we can on a Sunday morning. So I look down now and there's 84 participants. Now that's obviously more than 84 because it's probably near 150, 200 people. What a privilege for us all to be able to meet together. Yes, I know we miss dearly those that uh, aren't able to or don't feel comfortable meeting with Zoom, but there has been something very special with us being able to meet together that I would like in some ways uh, to keep together as we go ahead. If you are new and you've never been with us at All Saints for one of these services before, then some of the things uh, we say together, some of the things are led. We try and do some praise and worship in song to the living God as best we can. That's perhaps one of the most frustrating and difficult things about this is that we can't hear each other uh, singing uh, and praising the living God together. We're going to begin now with a short prayer that uh, we're going to say together, but let's just be quiet for a moment and then I will lead us in this prayer and join in. But let's be quiet and remember that we meet in the presence of the living God, who even though we're in our living rooms, our dining rooms, uh, rather than in the church building and together, is nevertheless with us by his spirit, because that's what church is, God's people meeting together. Let's be quiet and then we'll say this prayer together. And so we pray, almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to uh, say one of the great psalms, one of the great songs of God's people together now, Psalm 100. So let's all say this together. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We're going to praise God in song now. In the words of the great hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's sing together.
think we're heading now to Libby for our all age zone, if that's right. Morning, everybody. Um, so this morning um, in Stomp, we've been talking about um, good stewardship and being um, a good steward. And it's been really nice, I think, over this time to see how um, the community has really come together and helped each other. And we've been talking about that and um, some of our children have been helping um, elderly neighbours with shopping and that kind of thing. Um, so it's really good to see. Um, and we also talked about how we can um, look after our planet as well. And we talked about how perhaps in the last few weeks, people haven't been quite so good at being good stewards. And we've seen a lot of litter around. Um, and we talked about perhaps going um, and doing a litter pick of the field to try and make um, our environment in the village look nicer again. Um, yeah, so it's really important to think about our good stewardship, but I think that that's something that's really been highlighted over this time. Um, people helping each other out, doing shopping, going to get prescriptions and things like that. So that's been really great. Um, and our um, song for today, our children's song, I think is a new one to All Saints. Um, we definitely haven't done it since I've been here anyway. Um, so um, I thought we could, I would show the actions um, so you know how to join in in a minute. Um, but then the song's called City on a Hill and it talks about being a light in the darkness. Um, and that's what we said that as good stewards, we can show Jesus's love through the things that we do. Um, and the words say, um, I am a light in the darkness. Um, Jesus living in me can change the world. So through us, we can do things that change our environment um, and make our um, community a better place to live. So um, these are the actions so that you can join in. So it starts that I am a city on a hill. I am the light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. Um, and there's a couple of rounds of that. And then it says, let your light shine, 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 let your light shine. So it's, I am a city on a hill. I am the light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. Um, so I think if we could go to the song and then we can uh, give that a try. Change the world. Shine in my 
Brilliant. Thank you, Libby. Thank you for that uh, great new song that I'm sure we'll be uh, living by, but also singing as a church in the coming weeks and months. Uh, as I say, uh, there is still an awful lot going on in the church family, and maybe this is an opportunity for you to do something that you wouldn't perhaps normally have the opportunity to do. So you'll see from the notice sheet today that our musicians are getting together and doing an online course over six weeks. Uh, they're going to do that together. Look out for details about that if you'd like to join them in that, understanding a bit more about what we're doing as we worship God in song together. There's also an opportunity to join the Southwest Gospel Partnership as they put on uh, various different forms of study days coming up from one-off days to whole uh, terms. Or there's the uh, Peninsula Gospel Partnership, which is the same kind of thing uh, down in Exeter. There's all sorts of online study things that we can be doing and uh, growing about and there's details of the Southwest Gospel Partnership training and studies in the notice sheet. Start the week prayers is tomorrow at 9.15 with Peter and Jackie Chu leading that and back due to popular demand is the All Saints quiz night on Sunday the 5th of July is the next one. Watch out for details of that. You'll also have seen, if you've been picking up the thoughts for this week, that there's a book that I've recommended called The Cross in Four Words. Uh, there's uh, copies in the church porch. It's less than 100 pages. Uh, if you want to make a donation of uh, three pounds to the cost, either put it through the uh, church office in an envelope marked with the treasurer or just keep it until we get together and put the money in the collection plate again next time. But there's uh, uh, details about that again in the notice sheet as well. We're hoping that we can, as you'll have seen in the press, that we can reopen the church for private prayer this week. But rather than opening it all the time, we've uh, done a risk assessment and various things. And we're going to open the church just on Wednesdays uh, for you to pray on your own or as your uh, household bubble, as it were. The church will not be supervised during that time, so please make sure you clean your hands on the way in, clean your hands on the way out, and follow uh, careful instructions if you'd like to use All Saints Church for private prayer. The reason is that uh, for Wednesdays is that so that if in future weeks we decide that we are able to do uh, some kind of service back in church at some point, then uh, the church will not need cleaning before and after because it will have had 72 hours. Uh, to uh, sort itself out. So do contact the church wardens or the church <laughs> office if you have any more queries on that. So lots going on in the life of the church still, and uh, there'll be more uh, that you can read about in the days and weeks ahead as well. We're going to move now though to the reading from God's word. David will preach in a moment, 
Uh, but first of all, our reading from Ephesians, and uh, Audrey is going to be reading to us from God's Word. Audrey. Our reading is taken from Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. Unity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. A prayer as we begin. Risen and ascended Lord, send your spirit now to open our eyes to the truth of your word and to warm our hearts that we may love and serve you more. Amen. What do you want to be when you grow up? Can you remember being asked that question when you were a child? What do you want to be when you grow up? It was one of the standard questions asked by elderly relatives, and it seemed to suggest that there wasn't anything important about your life there and then, but being a child was all about preparing for when you were older. And as we know, children notice whether we listen to them and whether we want to know about the things that interest them now, even if it's just a stick they've picked up on the path or a part of a toy that's broken. And they also notice whether we listen to them when they come to church. There used to be a saying, the children are the church of tomorrow. Well, I'm not particularly fond of that. I prefer to say the children are a part of the church of today. And one of the things I enjoyed about last week's streamed family service was having young people leading our prayers rather than making them wait until they're grown up before they're thought ready to do so. But it's still worth asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? This picture, get the technology to work. This picture shows what I'd have said if you'd asked me when I was seven or eight. I'd say that I wanted to be a steam engine driver. And it's good to have some goals that we're aiming at for college or for a career or for physical fitness targets, as long as we remember that they are goals that we've set ourselves 
so we can modify them or even change them completely as the years go by. In fact, I did fulfill that ambition to be an engine driver because there, that's not just any old engine driver, not even a Marks and Spencer's engine driver. It's the engine driver who let me drive his engine. When I was 15, I was up near Liverpool and we did a deal. He'd let me go in the cab if I took a photograph of him and his fireman and posted it to him. And that's what happened. And he let me drive it for about 50 meters along the tracks in the engine shed. Well, that was one goal I did fulfill. Like a lot of others, I haven't. But at a deeper level, we should also want to consider what we want to become, what we want to become as a person, what we want to become in our relationships with other people, and above all, what we want to become in our relationship with God himself. And those goals shouldn't just be the ones we've set ourselves, but the goals that God has set for us, the ways that he wants us to grow up. Today's passage from Ephesians chapter 4 is all about growing up, growing up in our own faith and growing up as a church, about what we're aiming to become both individually and together. Can you remember the words that we put at the top of every service sheet or weekly notices, the words that sum up our calling as a church? There they are, becoming and making mature disciples of Jesus in Trull, Angersley and beyond. That summary of our calling is the sort of thing Paul means in chapter 4 and verse 1 when he writes, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul's referring to what he said at the end of chapter 3 in verse 19 when he prays that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And he describes this goal more, in more detail in verse 4, 12 of chapter 4, 4, when he says that the risen and ascended Jesus works in his church so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Well, that's becoming and making mature disciples of Jesus, isn't it? So we need to pay attention to Paul's explanation of how Jesus goes about equipping his church, make mature or grown-up followers of himself. In verses 1 to 6, Paul emphasizes how important it is that we're united it's all about growing up together rather than going it alone. It's about supporting each other rather than thinking that we can manage on our own. And then in verse 7, we, we read that we all have our parts to play. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. It's clear from the next verse that when Paul speaks here about grace, he isn't here speaking about the wonderful truth that we're all restored to a relationship with God because of his grace alone. That came back in chapter two. Now he's talking about the gifts. The gifts, the abilities and possibilities that Jesus gives to every one of his followers, including you, even if you think you've been left out. What he says in verse seven is this. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And if you're not sure what gifts you have been given, then why not ask someone whose judgment you trust what your gift might be and how you might use it? And let's be on the lookout for the possibilities that we see in each other and encourage each other to explore new ways of service. Let's be ready to be a sounding board for their ideas, to pray for them as they give it a go, and to stand by them if they don't get it all right first time. But remember, using our gifts isn't just a matter of personal fulfillment, although few things are as fulfilling as finding what Paul described earlier in his letter in chapter two as 
the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. The point about the gifts that Christ gives us is that they're for serving others and for helping the church to grow up towards maturity. Look back at how Paul puts it in verses 12 and 13. He writes there that Christ's gifts are to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And Paul writes that just after he's been talking about the leadership roles that some people are given as Christ's gifts to his church. So we read in verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. And their role is not so much about what they themselves do, but how they get all of us ready to serve God and to build up each other. I think a good illustration of that in present circumstances is what's going on amongst the 8am congregation. One or two of them are with us here on Zoom, but many of them have already shared worship together this morning in their own homes without the use of the internet. They've used the traditional prayer book with its collect and Bible readings for this Sunday. They've pictured each other in their minds as they've prayed for each other. And later today, they'll be getting in touch on the phone to see how they're getting on. And all this happened on the initiative of some members of that congregation, rather than waiting for it to be organised for them. Well, you might say, what's the rector been doing about it? And the simple answer, in a way, is nothing at all, apart from prayers and words of encouragement. But in another sense, this mutual support of the eight o'clock congregation is the fruit of years of pastoring and teaching by different vicars here and elsewhere, so that they have been, as Paul puts it, equipped for works of service so that the body of Christ is being built up. A time of spiritual growth now is partly the fruit of faithful sowing of God's word in the past. I expect there are other ways in which these strange times through which we're passing at the moment could be times of growth. The times when we grow up are often the challenging times. Just think of those teenage years that we can be very puzzling as we try to establish our own identity. And also very challenging for the parents and teachers who we're trying out that identity on. But those challenges are probably an essential part of the growing up process. This pandemic is making us focus on what is important in our lives. The cues last Monday suggest that some people it's still shopping. But the eight o'clock, as I mentioned a few moments ago, are finding that one-to-one -one contact and encouragement of each other is perhaps easier when they're not focused on trying to make sure that all the jobs that are needed in a church service are being done. And they'll be thinking about how to keep those links up even when we can get back into the building. I believe that God can help us to grow spiritually both on our own and as a church at the moment, even if there are growing pains along the way. Please be clear that I'm not saying that's why this pandemic is happening. What I am saying is that there are many examples of how, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. In this church, we often talk about our front lines, the places in our family, our work and our neighbourhood, where we interact with a world that largely ignores God or even rejects him. For many of us recently, our front lines have changed or have shrunk as we've worked from home or we've been furloughed or we've been unable to visit the grandchildren. Perhaps we've been seeing more of our immediate neighbours or we've reconnected online with more distant members of our families. We may have discovered new opportunities of service 
or new openings to talk about the differences our faith makes when we're up against it. Or perhaps we found that the gift we need most is the gift of listening. There's so much in today's reading about what will help us to grow up to be more like Jesus. So I'm going to pick out two phrases that particularly speak to me at the moment, but I'm sure you could find others for yourself in the passage. First of all, in verse two, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Being gentle, is so important when people are more on edge than usual, even though they may be unaware of this until unexpected tears or sudden rash words show how fragile they have become. And we'll be glad then if we've been gentle with them. Bearing with one another in love is how we treat both those who are struggling with the technology when we aren't and how we treat those who seem to know everything else about it that there is to know when we don't. Then in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. We don't have to choose between truth and love, but love helps us to know when to tell some of those truths and what you, words to use to express them. We also show our maturity in the silences when we simply listen. Did you notice that both those verses include the words in love? Whatever the times we're going through, growing up towards Christ will always be growing in love. And that's the theme of today's collect, special prayer for today, which I'll say in a moment after we paused for just that moment of quiet. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Before Andy Hansen leads us in our prayers, we're going to listen to Do Not Be Afraid, an anthem by Philip Stopford, which was written for a baptism near Lyme Regis just 10 years ago. The words by Gerard Markland, based on Isaiah chapter 43, speak to us of God's presence with us in troubling times. As you'll see, the choir of St Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney, is spread out to sing this anthem as they recorded it just before lockdown in March. <laughs>
Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your day today and for the freedom to meet on screen to worship you. Thank you for the continued fall in UK coronavirus that allows us more freedom so that we can pray individually in church from Wednesday. Please give wisdom to the scientists, politicians and others with influence as they take steps to ease the lockdown. We lift to you those who have been affected by COVID, either directly through illness or whose jobs and income has been reduced or put at risk. We pray also for those facing loneliness or difficulty during the restrictions. As a church family, please help us to support one another and the wider community. And we thank you for what the young people have been doing that Libby told us about during her session. May our community know we are Christians by our love. Further afield, we pray for the families of those killed in Reading last night. As they deal with this traumatic event, we ask that your comfort and healing would be with them. And in your wider world, Lord, we pray for those countries where coronavirus is expanding, in South America and South Asia, we pray particularly for your protection on the poor and vulnerable in those countries. We also pray for places suffering through conflict 
and we particularly lift Yemen to you now. We pray for humility and compassion for those driving the conflict and protection and restoration for the suffering people of that country. We also lift your church throughout the world to you. We ask for your intervention in countries where your church is persecuted. We thank you for the courage of worshippers there and ask that you would protect them and change the hearts of their nation's leaders. We lift you our mission partners at the New Life Foundation in India and Heidi and Bosco Bakira in Uganda. Please guard, guide and sustain them, we pray. And we pray for our church family here in Trull. Please give energy and strength to the church leaders and staff and all those who give their time in so many ways. We also ask for your hand to be on John and Mary Guy and Anne Hancock at this time. Thank you, Lord. In your name's sake. Amen. Come to our last section of worship in this uh, service this morning, our song, last song. Um, we just remember what has been told to us this morning, that we, no matter what in our life, it is for our place to call out our praise to our God and to be a light for those around us uh, and, to, and to show our love both for, for our God who has saved us and also for those around us. His holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day for me. It's time to sing your song again. Still my soul sing your praise anew. 
Let me pray for us, picking up Paul's great prayer at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be full to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all ages, forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us, this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.